Welcome to the Propreneur Podcast, where we help practice owners become better entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Dino Watt. Welcome once again, everybody, to the Best Practices Podcast. I'm your host, Dino Watt, as always. And again, today we are going to have an amazing guest that's going to help us understand more about the best practices in our businesses. And I'm excited to have her because I think it's a very unique and uh, probably misunderstood conversation and topic. And we're going to share that information with you. My guest today is uh, is the, an expert in what she does. She is a um, code matician. Let's just say that, like, right? It's a code philosopher. Uh, it's, it's Patty DeGangi. And Patty, we're excited to have you here. Thanks for being here. Thanks. I don't know if I've ever been called a code philosopher before, but that's Sweet. right on. That, you're right <laughs> on on that one. That's really what it is. Good. That's what I want to do. I want to make sure that I'm giving you something unique and different, right? That's what we do here at Best Practices Podcast. So we're going to talk about how to code accurately and more importantly, I believe, efficiently. I, I think a lot of people misunderstand the power of efficiency when it comes to what they do. A lot of people will say, oh, well, I'm doing the thing that I was told to do, but are you doing it efficiently? So Patty, before we get into all of that, please introduce yourself to the audience and let them know a little bit more about yourself. Well, as you said, my name is Patty DeGangi, and I am a longtime clinician that loved what I did, always enjoyed patient care, but decided there's only so many hours in a day. Although I sometimes have to still remind myself of how many hours there are in a day because I seem to like need 29. Anyway, I knew that I had only so much time that I could do to see patients one on one, and I thought if I could pop my pebble into the pond in a different place, then those concentric circles could affect more clinicians. So I became a speaker and author. Um, I've been at that for over 25 years now. And through, well, it's just, a, it's through that process that I really discovered who I am and my message. And my message and my brand, dental codology, which is a word I made up, study of dental codes. I love made up words. That's great. I love made up words. <laughs> It's based on three basic premises, and it is that we can have a world with no oral cancer, that we can have a, we can cure, not just manage periodontal disease, and that we can have a caries free world by 2020. Okay, that's a big goal. We better get, get on that one. Re, what I'm talking about here is the idea that we can have a world of health. Dentistry, as well as all the healthcare, has been all about disease. We, it really comes from if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So my whole company, um, whether it's my courses that I give, the books that I write, my membership group that I have, my coding group that actually proactively works on codes by going to ADA and, and, and lobbying for them, and even my education arm is all based on those three principles. Wow, that's a lot to unwrap. So let's play with some of that because uh, I'd love to go back. Let's go back first, right? Let's go back to how you uh, like got started in this industry. And, um, and, and I'm unaware, were you a provider or how did you get involved in the industry? I'm a clinical dental registered hygienist. And I saw patients, actually I saw nice. patients from, uh, I want to say the first year that I saw them. Oh, you don't have to say the first year. That's right. Far but back. It, it, is, it is 40 plus years, including through the years that I've been speaking and writing, because I felt that it was really important that I remain as a clinician to, to stay real, to stay in, because I was in the trenches and continue to learn every day from my patients, as well as learn how I can better reach our clinicians about how, how they can get better, because I'm doing it myself. So I'm always so interested in the origin story of people, right? Because I think what uh, I think we work from not a place of how we do stuff, but why we do stuff. So what made you choose the dental profession? Oh, wow. Because when I was in high school, my options as a woman at that time, I felt where I could be a teacher, a nurse, or a secretary, and I thought, okay, I'll be a nurse. So I said that. And I took science classes that I really don't like that much. Um, and I became, I was preparing for nursing school. And it, what happened is my senior year of high school, um, the, our family dentist needed somebody to work after school. So I did that. So I started in our family dental office. That derivation story is a very common story for many 
but particularly women in dentistry, that we started as a dental assistant or an office, you know, a person re answering the phone or filing the charts. Yeah, that's how I started. And I was still on the nursing school track. And because when I started in hygiene school, it, it wasn't a very well-known profession. Um, actually, what's really interesting is I looked at not too long ago and really realized that my license number here in the state of Illinois, where I mainly practiced, is 1943. That means there was only 1,942 hygienists in my state before me, which wow. right there is like, wow, wow, it's interesting. I, dental hygiene has now become so ubiquitous that everybody expects to go to their dentist to get their teeth cleaned by a dental hygienist that we think was always that way. It wasn't. It wasn't. Even in that dental office, um, there, we didn't, uh, there was uh, no hygienist um, at all. Now, I didn't live in, mm. in a rural area. I live 20 miles west of downtown Chicago. It's just that things have become where they are through the growth of this industry and it has grown exponentially over the past many years. That's fascinating <laughs> to think about that. That you, you, We haven't all thought about that idea before that, I mean, we just do assume that there's a hygienist when we go to the dentist that has been there forever and that hasn't been how it always was um what an interesting thing to think about right uh i love that that's great so obviously you grew into this passion now there's a passion for hygienist uh, being a hygienist and then there's a passion for coding that came along somehow because if you're the code philosopher as we're going to call you code, code office <laughs> code, code, code officer i don't know I, I like making up words too people have been at my propanor event no i totally love making up words so <laughs> where did that passion for coding come in because it's really such a unique um uh, area for everybody especially you know as as insurance uh, ways you know as it, it became it, at one point it was such a, a huge and crucial thing and, and a huge crux to people's business and now it's being a little more flexible, if we will, around as a business owner, as a practice owner. How did that passion come into play? Well, there's a bridge in between those two things. It's certainly, I certainly didn't go into coding because I like numbers. Because again, going back to the idea of dental hygiene right. school, one of the, my appeals was there wasn't much math. So how I ended up here in a number based, it's like there's part of me going, wow. But the bridge is really, again, when I talked about what my goals became as a clinician and as a speaker, and that's that changing into that goal of goals of health. Now, yeah. codes actually serve three purposes. Um, and one of them is certainly the reimbursement, third party reimbursement, but not only for that. What they serve two other important, very, very important purposes, which is actually another part of the passion line work, is what we have the potential to do with interoperable electronic health records. Now, one of the reasons I love this opportunity to talk to you, Dino, is because we're not talking just to dental people here. We're talking to chiropractors, we're talking to all kinds of practitioners. And the one thing that I know is we gotta work together better because I've heard. Now, you might have had another speaker on, on this that have said this, but did you know that the mouth is connected to the rest of the body? Yeah, it's called the oral system. <laughs> <laughs> the oral system is kind of <laughs> Yet the reality of making that actually be something that we work together on still doesn't exist. Still doesn't exist. Not really in the way that it could potentially do. So the way we can do that is through electron, interoperable electronic health records. Interoperable is the key word of my thing. What does it mean that all the different systems talk to each other? We have the technological way of doing that, but what we don't have is the behavioral or other ways of connecting to each other. So that's another part of that work. So the codes represent a way to connect the numbers because it all comes down to numbers, but and even um, a, a second purpose besides third-party reimbursement, HIPAA says that CDT codes are the standard code set for electronic dental record. So in other words, even if a practice chooses to have it not be involved with third-party reimbursement at all, and many of there are many, certainly a segment that do, that don't get involved with them at all, you still have to use proper coding in your electronic health record. Okay? So that's fascinating to me because as someone who doesn't have to deal with the coding and this is uh, kind of a, a new uh, topic for me, what I hear you saying is that here in the insurances, I got too excited, uh, the insurance companies, they all have the same code process and codes. So they've, they've made it possible for us to have 
uh, conversations with one another, depending on the discipline, right? Chiropractor can talk to the orthodontist based upon the codes. The problem isn't the code. The problem is the person, the practice inside of that, uh, the practice that that person, that doctor or that doctor's company does or does not do with the other practitioners. So it's the doctor of chiropractic not talking to the, the dentist or the dentist not talking to the plastic surgeon or the, like it's, it's a human error problem, not an actual product problem. Is that correct? I don't know if I call it an error because it's our uh. system. It, you know, an error means that we chose something and we made a mistake. We don't even think to choose it. We don't even yeah, know what's on the list to be cho cho chosen. Yeah, yeah. The other thing is it's not dental codes that will connect us to the greater rest of healthcare. Dental codes are a start. Why? Well, the rest of the world uses ICD medical codes and other types of medical coding. Dentistry has its own unique code set, which is interesting in and of, of itself mm. and problematic, but it's not the carriers that per se created them. In dentistry, what's really interesting is CDT, which stands for Common Dental Terminology, that's the, that's the book, is owned by the American Dental Association, which is interesting that a trade group owns the codes, but they do. And the way we know that is it's been litigated. See, codes the way we exist with them now, we're not always that way. It, what happened is it used to be that each carrier had their own coding system. They had their own forms. They had their own. We didn't even universally use the same tooth numbering system. And what happened is back in 1985, ADA, the American Dental Association said, hey, we've got to get involved here and create some kind of standardization, et cetera, et cetera. So they did. They came out with their first book in 1991, formalized as we know it now in 1991. They're going to update it about every four to five years. Second one came out in 95, and then the world started spinning faster. Because in 96, the HIPAA regulations came in, all about electronic health records. But also, it was around that time, shortly after, the insurance carriers themselves, third-party carriers said, hey, we need to have a say in these codes, because it shouldn't be just a bunch of dentists that get to decide what these codes are. And the ADA said they own them, and the carrier said you don't, and they went back and forth and went to litigation. And that litigation was, well, they both say they won, <laughs> but what happened is there, is a, there was a, a committee that's an equal balance between the payers and the provider. And this, part of me, I'm going down this road because this leads into an important part of my work. It still is, there's a 21 member committee now that decides on codes, and, but the, because our world started to spin faster, we're gonna get new codes every four years, we get them once a year, once a year. Mm, wow. Okay. And that's to accommodate for the technologies and the training, changing diagnostics, et cetera, et cetera, that we have. Well, one of my passions as a registered dental hygienist is to get a dental hygienist on that coding committee because our entire part of the profession is not represented because we don't have a seat at the table. So that's a big part, again, of my wow. work. Now, we, I can't have a say because every dental professional can have a say. I could actually tell, you can go right on, I can pick up my cell phone right here and I could click into the ADA website and I could submit a code. And as long as I do the paperwork, like the committee is required to listen, to read, to hear the, you know, at least listen to it, that doesn't mean it's going to pass because there's a whole lot of right. politics that go with it, but yeah. that's the process of it. So yeah, it's an interesting place where dentistry is for codes. And we can, we can, dentistry can already be using ICD medical codes, creating that bridge. Most practitioners don't have a clue how to start where it is because as different in dentistry from other the medical side is we have no certifications for coding. We have no training for coding. There's no coding education and dentist background, yet we face it the very first day we walk into practice and every day thereafter. Um, so you said something I think is very interesting that I like to unravel here. You said that you said twice that the world it started spinning faster. You have I call it the evolution of the practice, right? You've been involved with, you've seen the evolution of the practice happening over the last few years. What do you feel is um, on the horizon? Because I I think it's much more interesting to look to the future than it is uh, always to the past. So you're dealing with that on a daily basis. What's on the horizon? What's coming that maybe people should be more aware of? Well, I'm a futurist by nature. 
I, I think that was understanding our historical past that also we can learn of where we want to do because that that's is actually right. the tagline of my dental codology brand is is shaping the future. That's wow. what we're about. I, nice. I'm, not ready, I'm not waiting for anybody else to do it anymore. So I made up my own world and word and just started forging my way ahead. <laughs> and the again, the numbers of dentistry are down. They're going to be down. Dentistry has already changed, yet most practitioners don't know it. What do I mean by that? Well, it, what the people that we serve, the biggest demographic that we have in our society now are the millennials. And people like to do all kinds of judgments about the millennials. I don't buy any of it. It's baloney. They're just a different generation. And there's a whole lot of them. And they wholesale sale are telling dentistry they don't want what we have. Now, my last book that I wrote is Teledentistry Pros uh, Path to Prosperity. And it's about the, again, collecting electronically. In an article I did not too long ago, I used a, and something old, <laughs> but it was something new. Many people, especially New Yorkers, know uh, the name Carnegie Deli. We've been to New York as a visitor. You've been to, you might have been to Carnegie Deli. You get a beef, you got a corned beef sandwich that big. Well, they closed a few years ago. And many people are nostalgic for it. So what happened is taking technology and where we are now, combining it with the past to where we're going in the future, is that Amazon, with their Amazon Prime shows, the show, the, what is it, the Mrs. Maisel, okay, yeah, it's one of the top comedies, I, I don't know if I got an award this year, I know I got awards last year. Yeah. Anyway, they're running their second season, so what Amazon did is they did what was called a pop-up restaurant, pop-up deli. They did a pop-up Carnegie Deli. Carnegie Deli. Okay, so what I see is dentistry in the future is pop-up dental offices where the dental, the, instead of everybody, because our tradition has been everybody goes to a place. Right. But if the places go to them. A right. place of business. In the same way a business might have a health club or they'll have a massage therapist that comes into their business. It, what I'm saying is the model that's always been has taken it's, us as far as we can for people being healthy. And we certainly haven't reached 100% health. And yeah, I, the public I, is telling us they don't want to come in every six months to the high jars to get yelled at about flossing. They don't want it. They won't do it. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a really great point. You know, you are seeing right now mobile chiropractic units. You're seeing uh, there's actually a company that started doing uh, mobile orthodontics mm -hmm. to where they're going out to companies and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's a great point, and actually. Man, if you are someone listening to this podcast and you're trying to think, how do I uh, separate myself from the competition, if you will? How do I get a, a bigger foothold into my area and my industry? Man, start some sort of mobile service where you're going out to these corporations and you're saying, hey, we'll come to you. Just like you said, the massage chair people. My wife is a massage therapist. And I back in the that. day, 20 years ago, she used to do that. She used to go to corporations and just go person to person. And the corporation would hire her to do as many people in the office, right? Same thing. That's a great idea with ortho, with uh, dentistry. That why not? Why not? Because the heart of where we're going to reach the different goals that I talk about is prevention. Prevention costs less than, than yes. repair. Our model has been repair. The millions and trillions almost were getting up doing implants. I got to be honest, an implant's a failure. A failure. A failure of our preventive system because mm. dentistry. Because cavities and really periodontal disease are preventable diseases. Yes. Preventable. A disease we can cure. Now that word, I am sure the dental people listed in here that heard me say the word cure and periodontal disease in the same breath, I broke a golden rule. No, we can't ever cure periodontal disease. We can only manage it. And you know, as long as our, our vision remains that all we can do is manage it, all we're going to do is manage it. Now, again, from the coding world, it's, starting to, it's really an interesting swing I've even seen in the coding world and almost pushing. Codes traditionally had been for something we were already doing. And so, hey, we need a number for that. Well, in the last couple of years, there's been a few codes have been added. Um, teledentistry, you two of them. We have two codes for teledentistry, even though hardly anybody's even doing it. But we have the codes already. Now, that also brings me to another point, the importance of codes, and that's metrics. Metrics are huge in any business. How are we going to make our yep. decisions? Yep. Yes, a lot of time. 
The other codes I think that are really interesting that are really changing and bringing the connections together was in 2018, we had a code for HbA1c testing. Okay, diabetes is a huge problem in our country and it continues sure. to grow, including the biggest growing demographic of, of people with diabetes is children. And yeah. it has to do with the obesity epidemic, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, so dentistry added a code for HbA1c chair side testing in a dental office. Well, why would we do that? Well, body research has shown that we, it, dentistry can affect, we still see people more preventively than people see their other practitioners often. So we have a role that we can play in helping people know what their management is and get them over to physicians. And the real key part of it is we're learning to speak other healthcare providers. Because dentistry, we like to talk about periodontal pockets and all these other things that don't have a lot of meaning to a lot of people listening here. But if I talk to them about HbA1c level, they get it. I talk about other vital signs, they get it. Yep. Because the first thing you do when you go into your medical provider is what? What's the first thing you do when you walk into a medical office? Do your uh, blood pressure. You do your blood, no, you're not. You're going to give your insurance card. Let's be real about uh, the world. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Had to do it, Dino. Had to do it. Now we need to give you your vital signs because vital signs are vital. Yeah. <laughs> That's another thing. Even though every dental hygienist and every dentist is trained to do it when we're in school, that goes away. We don't do that. Well, we need to. Well, what's again interesting from coding, we had the HbA1c code that came in last year. When 2019, a glucometer test was also added. Well, why is that? Well, HbA1c gives you a good idea of what somebody's glycemic control has been over a three-month period. But what is their glycemic control right this moment? We're doing invasive surgical procedures. We should know that. Mm. So that's another code. So that's where I see codes helping push the profession a farther along on this oral systemic road that we need to be on. So I'm a huge believer that the more value you can add to people, the more, um, the more they want to be around you, the more that they actually are willing to pay higher even prices, right? Investment into their own oral healthcare or healthcare in general. And this to me seems like a no brainer that if a, uh, a dentist and a dentist's office, if they added this, which is already there for them to be able to do, but if they added this, to their service, not only would it separate them again, it would give them a, a uniqueness, but it actually adds more value to you. When was the last time that you, you know, heard, I don't know, I'll just say for myself, when was the last time I ever heard of somebody going, hey, I went to my dentist and I found out I have high blood pressure and my glycemic levels are too high. You don't hear that too often because that's not what you're going to do. And yet, I, I speak at a lot of uh, dental speakers conferences. I'm going, I'm going to be in a big one coming up next month. And I hear people all the time talking about the oral health care, right? The, the, that uh, health care starts from the mouth and all that stuff. But what you're saying is, is really an interesting turn on that and almost oh, uh, something that I think should be more uh, evangelicalized, if you will, right? I said that word totally wrong. Preached more, if you will. <laughs> I do have Bible beaten Baptist background. So, you know, I, I do, I get it. <laughs> I get there it. You go. I can there fall into it a little bit. The thing is, you know, what's really interesting is, is you use the word add on. I, I don't think we could add on. The reason it why when people hear add on, they hear, it takes me full time to do what I do. You're right. Line, You're right. There's a line I can use. And I guess I'm, I think every healthcare provider on this call can relate to. I, have, I look at my audience and I'll ask, Anybody here besides me ever go through a half day or a full day and realize that never even went to the bathroom? We are so busy already with one-on-one -on -one patient care, adding on our work. That's when we have these new technologies. It's like, well, how am I going to have time to do this? It really takes a rethinking of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Because there's some things we do that have no scientific basis. They never did that we do them that way because we do them that way. And that's the part that is huge for us to rethink. We've always done it, right? That, that becomes the mindset of that's just how we've always done it. So we're going to keep doing it that way. Yeah, I even use that when I talk about fraud. I go fraud by ag ag accident, ignorance, or we always did it that way and not got caught. It's still fraud. <laughs> that's my oh, thing. I, mean, yep. I always did it this way. And what's interesting is I'm one of those people that has longer always often than the people that are saying that to me. And I can say, no, we didn't. <laughs> no, we haven't always done it that way. And even if it did, 
It's a great horse that got us this far, but is it the horse that we should ride in the future? Or a second question is why are we riding a horse? I'm going to call Uber. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Patty, here's the thing. I am a big fan and I believe that people are, um, those who really understand their profession, those who um, are going to make the biggest moves in this industry or in any industry are the ones who can break down complex things and make them simple for everyone to understand. That we don't get points for more, uh, for how often we can talk over people. We actually get more points for how we can talk to people and help them understand. You have broken down so many amazing things in this conversation so far. And I, for one, have a whole new understanding of it. I have new ahas that I can even take to my, pa or my patients, my uh, clients that I know people listening to this could take to their patients and hopefully include into their practice. And that's our whole goal here, right? To show people, share the best practices with people. So um, obviously we can talk to you all day long. You have a, a great, not only personality, but great information here, which I think is kudos to you that you can take something as I think a lot of people would uh, sometimes think boring or mundane as coding and make it interesting. And if you're interesting, then people are going to pay attention. If people are paying attention, then you're changing things. And I think that's awesome. So thank you so much for being a part of the show. Let me ask you, uh, we have a, kind of a, a speed round that I'd like to go through of questions. Is it okay if we go through those? Sure. Do I get points and prizes? <laughs> yes, you do. You oh, get an all expenses paid trip to Encino, California, if you're correct. Yeah. <laughs> I think and that'd be like saying- months here in Chicago, it'll sound real good. <laughs> For, for you, it'd be like saying, uh, all expenses paid trip to Wheaton. No. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So the first question is this, is what do you feel is the most expensive thing that private practice owners are missing in their practice? Sounds like it could be a pretty obvious answer, but I'm excited to hear. You know what? I had a dentist in my audience, actually, was right there in Arizona just a couple weeks ago that said it for me. He goes, I didn't know any of this stuff. He goes, I could make more money if I just took the time to understand it. Yeah. And another thing too is the metrics of coding really is where we can make our, our best business decisions because data-driven decisions because we've got the codes that are what creates our data. And there's so many codes that practices don't use because they think, well, I won't get paid for it. Well, codes are more than that because our, our that the, the Data-driven decisions can improve our outcome, and we have a way of measuring performance as well as driving the cost savings, and again, enhancing the quality of care, but most important, patient satisfaction. Patient you satisfaction. alluded, it's so true, you alluded to that earlier about how, um, I use the phrase all the time, where performance is measured, performance improves, right? If you're not measuring your performance, you're not going to improve it no matter what. Um, I'm a, I'm a big, not, I'm a, not a huge reader. I'm a huge book listener because that's my learning style. What's a book that you feel like every private practice owner should read? I probably should tell you, tell you about my book and Great. I will, but I'm going to tell you about somebody else's for book because when it comes to it's, and this is not limited to every dental practitioner. I think every health practitioner, actually people, Mary Otto, M O T T O wrote a book and you ready for the title? Mm -hmm. Teeth, teeth. She is, it's a fantastic book that is a complete situational analysis of where we are, but it's wrapped in human stories and the history of how we got here. So that one is the first one I recommend to all my audiences. If you haven't read the book Teeth, you need to. You think you know the story of how we are, where we are, but you don't. And she's done a fantastic job. She followed the story of that was got on the news, famous story of Derek Diamante Driver who died of a tooth abscess that went to his brain. And as a society, we spent a quarter of a million dollars trying to save his life when we could have saved his life with giving him a toothbrush. So that's the first book I recommend. I have a series of books and I mentioned already teledentistry and the teledentistry book I, I wrote, co-wrote with Cindy Purdy. She's another friend of mine who is in, the, she's also in the trenches. But I live in a, a, a busy area. She lives out, she's two, two hours west of Colorado Springs in the mountains. Only, pre, any, or only oral health practitioner in a hundred mile radius. 
She's got a different demographic than me. And we co-wrote this book together to talk about the power of teledentistry. It certainly is for the rural practices and people that are underserved, as well as how, I how we describe the other way. So what we did in our teledentistry Pathway to Prosperity books is we map, it's actually a workbook. We mapped out all of these different opportunities there could be. I included a big section on codes of the codes that we can use in those in teledentistry, no matter what the supervision is, no matter all kinds of things. But that's that's, that's a book I, that I really hope that people get and read. Awesome. Well, we'll put both of those in the show notes for sure and make sure people can link to those and get to those. Speaking of books, in my book, The Practice Rx, I focus a lot on team culture and team performance as the foundation of growth of any practice. So what do you see when you go out to these practices and you, you, you get to be kind of the, the new fresh eyes as you walk in? As the biggest challenge that these private practice owners are facing when it comes to team and culture? Routine. 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 Mm. What's really important now, I have a, my, my executive director who travels with me. She, she's also a dental hygienist and she describes herself as methodical. There's a difference between being methodical and being a robot. Mm. One of my first course, courses that I wrote back in the early 90s had a course title of Are You Autonomous or Are You an Automaton? I don't know if anybody really gets that title now, <laughs> but it's routine. We have these routines we fall into that take all of our time, and that goes into, again, the idea of adding or rethinking. Mm. Oh, here's the way how I say it to audiences. Have you ever talk, been talking to a patient and thought to yourself, did I say this to this guy or the last guy? Okay, that's, that, that's being an automaton. And yep. that's what I see is the, we, we like we get the comfort of sameness, except the world isn't the same. Here's one of the things I know. Everybody listening to me is 40, 40 minutes older than when we started. That means they're different. Life yep. is about change and dynamism. It's, it's not about let's keep it the same. So I think that's the one of the things that robs practices all the time is the sameness that we've always done it this way and we've got to continue doing it this way. Love it. I love it. Well, you mentioned your books earlier, but what's the best way that people can get a hold of you? Well, again, let's talk about my made up word, dental code codeology. Dentalcodeology.com. Simple as that. Nice. Dentalcodology.com. I, it reminds me of you. This is probably a reference you will not get, but uh, Paula Abdul used to have a record called Vibe Oli or a song called Vibology. It was the first concert I ever went to in my life. So uh, <laughs> Codology, Vibology, bring it. Uh, Dentalcodology.com. It will be uh, on the show notes as well. All right. So in uh, your vast experience of both life and business, You've heard a ton of advice, I'm sure. What comes to mind as one of the best pieces of advice you've ever received? Keep my fun meter on high while I do what I do. I have a business Keep your idea. fun meter on high? Keep my fun meter on high. And what, what I'm talking about is my personality. Mm -hmm. I'm very passionate. I'm very driven. And I can get so excessive in the business end of life. Mm. I have to have fun while I'm doing it. Yeah. And so even though I had, I could give all kinds of advice. I mean, and, and really, I mean, one of the things I say all the time is focus on the future, not just on the past. You can't give them empty pockets. You got to take care of yourself. Yet my best advice that I get, I, I got to keep my fun meter on. I love I it. it. So that's why, you know, this laughing that I do and the humor. Uh -huh. I do that for my own entertainment, but I also know from brain research, the endorphins go a little bit more for other people and that goes in a little farther. So there's all kinds of ways that, that it's, I can enjoy what I do. A hundred percent. Fun if, meter is, you know, and people that dread going to work every day, I feel sorry for them. That's totally. Fun. I do too. I see that all the time that it's like, man, if you're not having fun, why are you doing it? It really is this that we get you get one life you better have fun with it I'm a huge fan of I tell my audience all the time look if you're laughing you're learning and so we're gonna laugh a lot right yeah. and if I'm laughing then hopefully that as you said it becomes infectious yes. that's the type of infections we like the laughter <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> uh, all right so 
what is the best resource or tool that you feel every private practice owner should be using to grow their practice right now? Their own patients and their own staff. What do I mean by that? Often, you know, there's so many courses, there's so much information about getting a new patient, get a new patient. Talk to the people that we have already. But I mean, but talk to them and really listen to what they have to say and have our, have thick enough skin to listen to it. Listen to the people that work there. People that work there, they see things that the owner often doesn't. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. They're very, and they, say, and they see it from their own perspective. People will tell, patients will tell other people in the staff, and depending on which person it is, you know, that they might tell a dental hygienist one thing, they're gonna tell a dental assistant something else, they're gonna tell the office manager something else. But all of them together is where we get the best information we can about what our patients want and what brings them into our practice. And it's not the latest toy, it's not the latest technology. They expect that. It certainly isn't because we do the best infection control. They kind of expect that too. I mean, it's just all of those things are just techniques. They're not what makes our practice a success. So our best tool is our own staff. I call it using the human resources department, the people that work for you. Like that's the best human resources you'll get yeah. because you're, as you said, they see with new fresh eyes. Um, in my upcoming book, I talk about how your newest team members are your best value, right? Because they are seeing stuff that you aren't seeing. Even the old team members who are sitting in that jar for the last couple of years, they're coming in going like, why are you doing like that? You know, you could do it faster this way. Why are you doing that? Listen to them. And I love the point of be, having thick skin. Be a professional. Like getting feedback is, is not about criticism. It's about understanding that, oh, if someone, whether it be a bad review or a team member who leaves because of a certain thing, that's feedback. That's valuable. It's more valuable than any consultant you could ever hire. Absolutely. Absolutely. Love it. You know what, Patty, you and I, seriously, we could talk all day long. You've got yeah. some, you've, not only do you have a great fun spirit, so I appreciate that fun meter being turned up, but also the fact that you have such an amazing knowledge on something that I think not a lot of people take as, uh, maybe serious isn't the right word, but as, uh, as of a focus that they should. There's so many other shiny objects and coding doesn't always sound the most fun. You make it fun and you make it not only fun, but unique and, and important. I love your, uh, your ideas of bringing everybody together and having that conversation across the community of being a healthcare provider, how much better that would be. And uh, man, just a great resource of information. So thank you so much for being on our show today. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank I'd love to do it again. It was great. Absolutely. Uh, there, we'll have to do a part two. Everybody who's listening, please make sure you check out the show notes. Go check out uh, Patty at, at Dental Cody, Codology. Now, I was going to say Codology. You almost got oh, me saying it. You, you warned me at the very beginning. <laughs> Dentalcodology.com. And uh, we will see you on the next podcast of the Best Practices Podcast. Thank you for being here. Hope you have an amazing day. Thanks so much again for listening to the ProPreneur Podcast. We really appreciate your support. If you haven't subscribed already, please make sure you do so. Also, if you feel like you might be a good fit for our podcast as a guest or know somebody who you think would be, go ahead and email us at dino at dinowatt.com. Again, thanks for support. We'll see you on the next episode.